everybody. Um, this is a, a very strange way to do uh, a head teacher's talk. Um, I can see your names on the screen, but obviously I can't see your faces. Um, but under the circumstances at the moment, we just want to try and make sure that we don't compromise safety um, and that we, we make sure that we are being as sort of responsible as possible around all the COVID restrictions. Um, what that does mean is that, unfortunately, I'm not able to meet you in person, which is obviously our normal way of doing this. And it's really unfortunate that we're not able to bring you into school to see the school sites because it's a, you know, a school site that we're really rightly proud of. Um, I'm going to talk to you today and give you the speech I would normally uh, give at open evening. Um, and tell you a little bit about what I think are the kind of key unique features of the school. Um, but I'm also going to have some time at the end for you to ask questions. So one of our assistant head teachers is in the background doing the kind of admin for the call and he will be taking questions that you put in the chat uh, function and I will answer as many of those as I can by the end of the, the call and I will try and you know where the things that group together in themes so that I can answer those as efficiently as possible. If after this uh, call you still have questions, uh, please feel free to submit them to the school by email or to give us a ring. Um, our senior team or, my, or myself are very, very happy to call you back and answer any questions that you have. We recognise I recognise as a parent actually and as a head teacher how difficult it is to make this decision this year without being able to have the full experience of going around and visiting schools. So, you know, we want to try and help and support you with that decision um, in any way that we can from a, a kind of a safe distance. So I think the sort of starting point really is to try and um, convey a bit about what Haggerston School is about. And we have three statements which forms our mission statement. And it, it's kind of our, all of our sort of school improvement planning and um, all of the things that we do in school are built around these three value statements. Um, aspiration, we strive to be the best versions of ourselves. We work hard every day to master the knowledge and skills we need to lead successful and fulfilled lives. We create creativity, we create beautiful work to inspire others. We're independent minded, creative thinkers and problem solvers and character. We are articulate, confident and determined individuals. We work to build the qualities of resilience, ambition, curiosity and community spirit. And what I hope that that captures is firstly the sense of ambition that we have from an academic point of view for our students. We want them to be able to master the knowledge they need and then to be able to go on to lead successful lives. But also we want children to leave our school as adults um, with the kind of characteristics, the, the kind of mindset um, and confidence that they'll need to be able to make choices in their lives that will lead them to be happy and fulfilled. So I wouldn't say that one um, takes primacy over the other. We take quite a holistic view of education. So we want students to leave here really well rounded with the kind of sense of self-identity that comes from being a Haggerston pupil um, and having um, benefited from sorry, um, and benefited from um, from all of the different aspects of our broad education and curriculum and that's both the academic curriculum but it's also the uh, character education that we provide for students. Starting with uh, the academic uh, achievement of students over the last three years, and this is my fourth year in post now as the head teacher, um, but over the last three years, we've seen quite a consistent uh, movement forwards and uh, upward trend in student outcomes across all subjects in the school, actually. The, the, there's been a significant um, impact in terms of outcomes for all students of the school improvement actions that we've taken over the last three years. Um, so you can see on that, that grid, I won't go through them all individually, um, but the kind of journey that each subject is going on towards a really uh, um, fantastic set of outcomes for students at the end of their GCSE courses. Some of our foundation subjects are being shown now on the screen. So we are a school that has um, a long history of um, excellence in the performing arts. So students, all students in the school have an hour of art, drama and music um, and two hours of design technology every week. So a significant proportion of their timetable from Key Stage 3 um, onwards is um, built around the arts. And we think that's important, not just for children who are 
um, who were talented or minded towards studying performing arts at a later point, but also because we feel it really builds the, the, the creative uh, problem solving skills, um, a sense of confidence, um, a sense of students' belief in their ability to articulate themselves clearly and to think conceptually about the world. So we're rightly proud of our outcomes uh, across the art subjects, but we feel that it's more deep rooted in the sort of identity of the school. And that's why uh, one of our key value statements is about creativity. At A-level, we have a really growing sixth form. It has tripled in size over the last four years um, and our results have correspondingly improved. We had a little bit of a dip in results in 2019 because we had a, a cohort of students that um, were maybe less able on entry or had lower, lower GCSE grades on entry. Um, but we're really proud of the academic achievements of the students across all those three years. We usually have about a 50% um, transfer rate into Russell Group universities. It's sort of usually between 40 to 50 percent um, and almost all children in the sixth form or adults in the sixth form go on to study at university um, with a really diverse range of courses with just a few students who choose to follow um, degree level apprenticeships um, or other vocational qualifications. Um, it's quite a small and bespoke sixth form even though we're growing we don't we don't aspire to be bigger than 150 we can have just over 120 pupils in our sixth form um, and there's a the deliberate reason for that we want our sixth form to be able to give really bespoke support to our students so that means that they have very targeted careers work they have mentoring and um, they work with the access project which helps students to prepare for um, Russell Group universities both in terms of um, their UK CAS applications, their interviews, but also understanding that if they want to, for example, follow a medicine route or go into law or go to Oxbridge, we start that work with students in year 10 through the Access Project. So they begin building their experience, their work experience, but also their, um, their sort of portfolio of work towards being prepared, not just to be able to successfully apply for those courses or to those universities, but also to be ready and to thrive when they are there. We have a lot of other um, re relationships with L London universities um, each department in the school has a relationship with a, a university and we have uh, visiting lecturers to come and do presentations for students and lectures um, to help them to prepare for the kind of super curricular knowledge that they will need to um, to be successful with their university applications. And we have a particular relationship with um, London Met University as well, who offer a really diverse range of courses. So in terms of what I think makes Haggerston different from other schools in the borough, um, you have a choice of some phenomenal schools across Hackney. You're very lucky um, as parents in the borough to, to have a whole um, range of good and outstanding schools um, locally to you. Um, and I think that it's having gone through this process myself as a parent, I think one of the difficulties is about identifying which school is right for your child. So, um, what I would like to try and do now is, is express to you what I think makes Haggerston unique so that you are able to evaluate whether that is an environment that's right for your specific child and their needs and their individuality. So the first thing is that uh, one of the things that's unusual about Haggerston is that we have a very large school site. It's the largest school site in Hackney. Um, and the reason for that is that it was built in the 1960s when um, space for schools um, was a little bit uh, better. And we have a lot of outdoor space. We also have some excellent sports facilities and we have a grade two listed building. I'm not, uh, I don't profess to be a, a connoisseur of modern architecture, but every year we have groups of architecture students who come round as the, during, during the open house events. And, and they've told me an awful lot about how special the building is. It was designed by Erno Goldfinger. And when I first arrived for interview at the school, um, it didn't immediately strike me as a beautiful building. But now that I am working here day in, day out, I'm so appreciative of the quality of design. Um, and also appreciative that because it's grade two listed, when, when we replace or update any um, aspect of the facilities, it has to be done to a very, very high level. And that means that the building has an integrity and a quality to it that I think is very unusual in schools. We have really um, important specialist, if we go back a little bit, um, we have really important specialist facilities. So we have uh, drama studios that are, are like professional drama studios. We have a dance studio with a sprung floor. 
we have fantastic um, science laboratories and, and two years ago we had a 1.6 million pound refurbishment of our science facilities so that they have state-of-the-art um, uh, resources but also state-of-the-art um, interactive whiteboards and computers for students to use. The, in the photo that you'll be looking at on screen, um, to your right is the, is the, the image of the, the sort of new built uh, G block and that block is, is designated for the creative art. So there are um, in that block art studios, uh, design technology workshops where students can go and access um, specialist resources and materials to be able to, to achieve excellence in their, um, in their academic work in those subjects. But there are other benefits to the school site, which I appreciate on a daily basis, and particularly now in this very unusual time uh, where we are having to make a lot of limitations on student movement around site. We have an enormous amount of outdoor space, and that means that we're in the unusual, um, we have the unusual privilege of being able to offer a, a year seven their own designated playground. And I think that's really important because it means that they can play without being surrounded by the older children. And it allows them to play in an age appropriate way for that little bit longer and to make that transition to secondary school um, in, a, in a more gentle and sort of timely way. Um, each year group has their own designated space. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's right actually. And it's really helpful to us because it means that there is never a sense that the school is overcrowded at lunchtime and, and, and break time. And it makes for a much more harmonious uh, culture around lunchtime and break times. What that allows us to do, which many inner city schools that have limited space have, is it allows us to have quite a long lunch break. So relatively speaking, we have um, 55 minutes for lunch. Um, and that means that students really do genuinely have a break. They have time to eat their lunch without being rushed and they time to go out and play. And um, that's really important because for the rest of the school day, we have very high expectations of students. We expect them to be very focused on their learning and to, and to um, work through challenging tasks in lessons. We expect 100% concentration and focus from them and really good behavior from them in lessons. And we expect them to move around the school building in a very sensible, orderly way. So when they do get outside, we want them to be able to be children, to run around, to be able to play, um, to be able to let off steam. And I think that really helps them to get that kind of contrast and balance in their school day. Finally, we have fantastic sports facilities. So we have um, a number of outdoor spaces, including a MUGA, some tennis courts, um, and we have three different gyms, which allows us to do a really wide range of sports. And obviously we have other facilities on our doorstep, being fortunate enough to be in this part of London. Um, and we take children to the climbing center in Mile End. They go across to the park and play rugby. Um, so we, we're really able to exploit the rich resources that we have in our local area and in our school site. I'd mentioned before about our expectations um, of students during the school day. Um, and we are an unapologetically disciplined school. Um, we are a strict school. Children tell me all the time that we are strict. Um, and we're really unapologetic about that but because we are strict because we have the highest expectations of students. Um, we expect them to come to school in full uniform and to take pride in being a Haggerston student. We expect them to come with all of the equipment that they need um, in order to learn and to be ready to learn when they arrive. We expect them to give 100% effort in lessons to focus, to not distract others and not become distracted themselves. Um, but we do all of that because we care deeply about the students and we do it with what we call warm strict. So that is kind of the ethos of our, um, our school discipline policy. The stricter we are, the warmer we are. So our strictness is about uh, demonstrating to the children that our expectations of them are really high, that we're not gonna lower our expectations of them, but we are gonna support them to come up to those expectations. Um, and we're gonna support them to, to leave here at the end as students that have really developed strong sense of self-discipline, self-regulation, and the ability to, to have form really constructive, uh, positive relationships with their peers and with adults um, around them. And some children, 
uh, just that's super easy for them from the minute they set foot in the building and children who go through the whole week without picking up any corrections which is the the um, the, the sort of uh, demerits I suppose that we give when students um, uh, do something wrong uh, they get nine additional credits automatically for having gone through a kind of week and, and about 60% of our students in the school by the end of any given week um, achieve those nine correct nine cr um, credits so most of the students in the, our school um, it, it's just a breeze for them to come in and meet our high expectations but there are some students in the school who find it more difficult and for those students we have very bespoke interventions and support for students everything from um, uh, SEN interventions things like zones of regulation uh, where students are helped to supported to develop emotional regulation to speech and language or social communication support we do mentoring we do girls at self-esteem groups um, we have a whole range we have sort of 20 plus interventions that fall under the sort of behavior and um, special educational needs and then we have a whole other set of interventions for students um, where we feel that they would benefit from support around their well-being and mental health um, we are very fortunate to have our own school counseling service through a space but we also have our own designated um, professional who's a professional clinician who was works from with CAMS who works with us on site three days a week not only to support students who have um, more sort of fundamental um, uh, needs in terms of their mental health and well-being but also to help us as a school to develop policies and structures and supports in the school to help all children with well-being and mental health and one of the fundamental things that we've worked hard on over the last uh, few years is a culture in which students can com communicate openly and they're given the language to talk about their feelings um, about how they uh, that where they need support and that they recognize that's not stigmatized in the school that that's normalized um, and it's something that's part of being healthy and keeping ourselves healthy exactly the same way that you might go and visit a doctor if you had a physical ill health um, symptom so when students come in they have a very routine driven day we line students up we bring them into to the building in a controlled way and they move around the building in a controlled way and that's particularly important for the children who are the most vulnerable in the school so we do have some children in the school who have special educational needs and even for all of year sevens when you first come to secondary school the other children look are very big uh, when you first arrive and so it's really important that when children are moving around the school building that everyone in the school including the youngest children and the most vulnerable feel safe know that the corridors are predictable and know that they don't have to um, to, to ever in in their time in the school feel unsafe or feel um, concerned about the kind of you know a, a level of chaos when you've got a thousand children in a school it can get busy so we have designed the school day and the routines of the school day to support all students in the school to feel that everything is productive controlled um, and that there's a that the school building is a calm uh, place to be I mentioned earlier about um, creativity in the arts. Um, so as I said, we have safeguarded periods um, in, the, in the timetable for art, music, drama and design technology. So they have five periods a week in those subjects um, in a way that I think many schools um, with the, the pressure around um, the core subjects have not done. And we are unapologetic about that because, as I said, we feel that the students' experience in those subjects really helps them to thrive in English, math, science, history and geography because it gives children a different perspective on the world um, and helps them to develop that kind of rounded mindset and rounded understanding of the world because they're able to think about complex kind of uh, um, philosophical uh, questions in art and in drama. Um, they're able to understand the learning that they they have and the knowledge that they have from the core subjects and to interpret it and express it in different ways in the art subjects so we feel that there is a really symbiotic relationship between those different subjects which is beneficial for all students at some point in year eight students are able to um, uh, prioritize whether they want to continue specializing in design technology or whether they would like to specialize in computer science uh, but all of the other option subjects are chosen in year nine and we have another distinctive feature which is that rather than putting our subjects into blocks which restricts students choice at GCSE 
we give students an open choice, which means that seven of their subjects are predetermined. So that is the what we now consider to be the EBAC subjects, English, maths, science, a humanity subject and language. And that takes up seven of their option choices. And then there are two option choices which they have a completely free choice with. That means that if students are uh, minded towards the arts, they can study art and music or drama and art. Um, it's absolutely fine to do two art subjects. And that's something that's often restricted in schools through the blocking system at GCSE. But equally, they may want to study nine academic subjects and do computer science and economics um, and not, not take any of the arts. And that's absolutely fine as well. Because we feel that, that that basic arts education that children get at Key Stage 3 really helps them to be problem solvers, to think creatively in all of their subjects. And creativity is not just for us about the arts. When we go into math lessons, we want to see students tackling challenging um, problems. We want students in science to be doing uh, practical science and to be doing experiments and finding out for themselves um, exactly what is causing a particular reaction um, and we see that as being a kind of thread of creative teaching that runs all the way through the school that's so about making sure that students are engaged in lessons that they're enjoying their learning because we feel that that in turn is motivational to um, to students in terms of continuing and and wanting to do the best that they can and working as hard as they can so we have a, a challenging knowledge rich curriculum that runs all the way through um, from year seven to 13. Um, and we have back plans that. So we've looked at what would it take for a student to be an exemplary A-level student and achieve the highest grades at A-level? What would they need to master in year 12, year 11, year 10, all the way down to year seven? And we break the curriculum down into 10 core objectives that students are assessed on every year through a system called the DPR, which parents can get as an app on their phone. And they can see at any time in real time how their child is performing against each of those 10 objectives um, that have been set as the sort of fundamental benchmarks for that stage per, staging at each stage, how they are going to develop into um, the, those subject masters when they get to year 11, or perhaps even if they choose the subject at year 13. We have developed our own knowledge organisers, which is uh, almost like a textbook that we give students at the start of the year, which outlines all of the core knowledge that they need to master and that they will be assessed on throughout that year which really empowers parents and the child themselves to know from the outset what the expectations, what do the, what's the knowledge that they need to master in term one, in term two, and in term three. I know as a parent, often you're left kind of frustrated because you know your child might need a bit of extra support in a subject, but you don't necessarily as a parent, even as a teacher, have the expertise in that subject area to know how to support them. And our knowledge organisers give that support to parents. They say to the parents, in term one, focus on your child, making sure that they've mastered these two pages of key knowledge. And these are the areas they need to focus on now. Um, and lots of parents have fed back to us that they are incredibly supportive and instructive documents. Um, and they are sort of a fundamental tool that we use to help students be independent, not just in the classroom, but when they're working and studying at home. Um, as I said before, we don't see um, character education as being uh, something that's separate from academic education. We feel that fundamentally children are successful when not only have they got a great set of qualifications, but they've got those set of qualifications because they've developed um, the skills of, of self-discipline. They know how to work independently, but also that they have um, confidence in their own ability academically to critically appraise the world, um, that they are able to form really healthy, productive and positive relationships with their peers and with adults around them. And, and, and they, they're, they're fundamentally happy and well-rounded individuals. Um, we, we see all of those things as being holistic and interconnected, not at odds with one another. We have um, a really strong pastoral support system. So in every year group, there's a non-teaching member of staff that's available at all times for students to support them. And there is also a head of year that works as part of that team as well. And they lead a team of tutors that give that more individual and personalised support to students. We have in the year six character days and those character days are drop down days in the curriculum where we both teach the, the personal social health education curriculum 
but also where we we work on careers where we take in normal times children out on lots of trips so that their learning is contextualized in the wider world and we have a list of, of experiences character experiences that we want every child to have participated in by the time they leave Haggerston. So every child will have had an experience of going to a, a live theatre performance. Every child will have attended a sporting event. Um, and we want to make sure that each child has got opportunity to develop the cultural capital they need so that they can thrive in any different organisation or um, career pathway that they want to go in for the rest of their life but also more fundamentally so that students are taught and understand how to appreciate culture and to understand how culture enriches their life um, and enriches their sense of well-being and happiness um, as they go throughout their life. So, for example, reading is a really fundamental thing that, that's very important to us as a school. And apart from the um, expectation that children have a reading book with them as part of their basic equipment, they're given time in the library, they're given time in tutor time, to read texts collectively so for example we read um, Malala's autobiography in year eight and that's done as a whole class together during tutor time and teachers are able to talk to and discuss the issues that arise from that text together collectively and that's something separate to the English lessons because we don't want students to sort of pigeonhole reading as being part of English we want reading to be something that they do fundamentally um, all the way through their lives and that they develop a kind of lifelong love of reading that's easier with some children than with others so we have some very comprehensive support programs to help children who are struggling or reluctant readers um, and there is a whole designated literacy team that deliver those interventions whether it's very fundamental phonics based interventions or whether it's about supporting students to develop their interests and engagement in the um, in texts Um, one of the things that's changed significantly over the last three years um, is in response to feedback that we had from parents. Um, when I first started at the school, um, I, I introduced uh, coffee mornings once a half term and parents were able to come and tell me what they, their experiences were of, of, as parents of students at Hagston. And one of the things was that they felt they wanted more information more frequently about how their child was getting on but also they were very busy so they wanted that information in as succinct um, a way possible and as easily accessible as possible so we have um, introduced two apps one is called class charts and that's where all of our um, behavior and safeguarding and special educational needs information goes as a school and that means that when parents download that app when their child starts at the school on any given day they can see whether their child has picked up any corrections and what they're for um, they can see whether their child has picked up any credits and what they were for, which means that they can praise their child and see how their child is getting on, understand the reasons why um, their child may, for example, have, have got a detention at the end of the week. Um, but they can also use that as a, as a steer to, as to when they need to contact the school or when the school needs to contact them um, about anything that may be a concern. But most importantly, what Class Charts does is it lets children and parents um, see how well their child is doing. So those conversations are not happening when there's a problem. They're happening on an ongoing basis. And it gives parents an ability to really reward and praise their child when they can see that their child has made real effort and achieved um, a, you know, three, or three or more credits in a day, which is, which is a phenomenal achievement. The DPR, as I mentioned before, is more of an academic tool. In through the DPR, parents can access reports, not just the three times a year that they are um, sort of sent to parents and updated, but they can see the report at any time and they can log in and, and check what is it that my child is supposed to be mastering in maths. And as I said, it's, maths would be broken down like all the subjects into 10 core objectives that the, their child needs to master by the end of the year. And it's quite a sophisticated tool. So it's, it's based on students' pathways. When children come into Haggerston, they're placed in a pathway based on their Key Stage 2 data, their CATS data, and any baseline testing that we do when they start at the school. And that pathway sets them on a kind of journey towards a targeted grade at GCSE. And the, path, the objectives that they receive for the year are tailored to them based on their pathway. We set our classes in English, Maths and Science, all other subjects in Key Stage 3 are taught in mixed ability. But in English, Maths and Science, we feel it's important that students' learning is really tailored towards their needs and ability. Um, and we feel that that makes for, well, we know that that makes for um, accelerated progress for the students in the school. 
So finally, just to kind of summarize, I think how we approach, um, you know, how we plan and approach school improvement in, um, in Haggerston, we take an evidence-based approach. You know, we are always learning from the best schools in the country. Over the last three years, uh, the senior team and myself have been out to schools in Bradford. We've been at schools all, all across London um, to look at what, what is making this school really successful. And we're able to take from those schools um, the, the best things that we feel will work in um, Haggerston. Over the first, definitely over the first two years that I were here, well, I was here, and to a certain extent last year, which was a very unusual year with lockdown happening, we were on quite a rapid um, uh, sort of process of school improvement. So we made a lot of change in the first two years that I was here, and that was quite deliberate. We looked at every aspect of the school. We looked at the behaviour system. We looked at the curriculum. We looked at quality of teaching and learning. And we said, we need to create the template for the outstanding school that we are, are going to be. Uh, and our, our ambitions are very um, high. You know, we want to not just be one of the best schools in the local area. We want to be one of the best schools in the country because we feel that setting the bar any lower than that would be doing a disservice to the children at the school. We are now in a phase of our school which is a bit more established. So we aren't actually making fundamental changes now, apart from having to react to the current situation that we're in. The phase of school improvement that we're in at the moment is about implementation. So it's about making sure that we do everything we say we're going to do really, really well. And it's about refining what we do in smaller um, ways to make sure that we incrementally move towards the goal um, that I said, which is to be one of the best schools in the country. But when I say that we aim to be that, it's not in a kind of ruthless at all costs sort of way. It's in that sense of wanting to build sustainable um, progress for the school and wanting to make sure that students experience in school is the best that it can possibly be and that's in the broader sense of the word yes it's really important that our primary obligation is to make sure that school uh, children leave with with good academic outcomes but we want them to leave with so much more than that and we know that the best schools in the country enable their children to do that and we're so proud every year to, to shake the hands of our children as they go off into fantastic universities, do fantastic courses, because we know that actually the experience they've had at Haggerston has led to them being really rounded, confident, good individuals who have a really strong sense of their uh, of morality, of their contribution that they can make to their community. And all of these things more and more, particularly in the world that we live in, are so fundamental, I think, to the responsibility that educationists have um, to, to educate children in that broader sense. We have very high expectations, and that means that we believe every single child is capable of making excellent progress. We don't make excuses for children, even when they have challenges. Um, we care really deeply about our students, and one of the most um, one of the things that I have I love about this school, which I wouldn't attribute to anything we've done in the last three years, because it pre-existed me, and it will still be in place, you know, long after I'm sure that I have retired. But it is that this, there is a really strong relationship between children and staff and their families. And we know that that is a really important sort of triangle of relationship. Um, so we're always looking of ways that we can work with families to make sure that we support your children in the best possible way. Um, in terms of some of the practicalities of the application, for the last two years, we were asked by the local authority to take additional numbers in response to increased demand and a shortage of places across the borough. So for two years in a row, we've taken over our numbers. But this year, our planned admission number is 180 and it will remain as 180. So and it will remain as 180 for any subsequent year groups, too, because we we're at our capacity now in terms of numbers. What that means is we have been oversubscribed in the last two years and we've been able to offer um, parents uh, places because of that, um, those bulge classes. But that won't necessarily be the case this year. So it is really important, you know, just like the local authority, I'm sure will have said that you submit your application on time. It is a first come first serve um, uh, process and that you're, you know, that you're clear about what your preferences are. Um, having said that, um, you know, you know, we, we take students from a wide uh, 
across the borough from a wide range of different areas, including Tower Hamlets and Islington, because we are right on the border of two different, um, of, of three boroughs actually, we're in Hackney, but we're on the border of two others. Um, and so, you know, if you want any further information from us about the likelihood of you being able to get in from your particular address, then please um, send an email to our admissions team. We'd be happy to sort of support you and advise you about what the likelihood of that is. Um, because we're reducing our numbers back to 180, um, we can't necessarily use the last two years as a clear indication of distance. Um, so it's important that you know, we recognise that actually when you put your preferences down, um, it will be to some extent a little bit of a lottery depending on how many other applications there are and where those have come from. Um, the email address uh, for any inquiries is transition at Haggerston dot hackney dot sch dot uk that information is available on our website on the on the um uh transition page as well um so if you haven't got a pen and paper to hand feel free to go on and have a look at that there so that's the end of the presentation um hopefully now we'll have uh, some opportunity for to to answer as many questions um as i can that have come through um if you just bear with me while I just speak to Patrick about the best way to do that. Okay. okay. Yep. Okay, so I've got quite a few and I'm just going to work through them one by one. So bear with me. Um, the first one is when will you be able to confirm arrangements for banding tests? So we already have a, a weekend blocked out for that um, in our calendar and we're just waiting for confirmation from the Learning Trust about which specific date it will be. Um, and as soon as we know that, we will be publishing that on our website and sending out information as will Hackney um, as well. So that it should be in the next couple of weeks. I would hope to have it before half term. If not, it'll be the first week after half term. It usually happens at the end of November. So it is generally um, is a, one of the last two weekends of November or sometimes the first weekend of, of December, but rarely. Um, the next one was uh, what extracurricular um, uh, sorry, my, it's, excuse me, bear with me while I just find the question again. Actually, I'll do the next one. Um, apologies. Someone's asked a question about safety after school. Um, you know, I wouldn't underestimate the, the challenges in Hackney that all schools face around safety of students on the streets. Um, but we do patrol the areas after school um, as staff and we have a school police officer that patrols with us. So we have uh, three patrols that go out into three different areas on a regular basis, including sort of walking around the park. Um, we have very low incidences, actually, of any incidences of, of, um, of students having problems on the way home. But we work with families to talk to them from the outset about the importance of students finding safe routes home, going straight home after school and not hanging around. Um, generally, our, um, we don't have issues in school um, with high levels of violence because we have an absolute zero tolerance on any incidences of violence. So if a child um, physically hurts another child in the school, they will be excluded. And that is absolutely made clear to everybody across the school. And that makes for a very safe environment. I would never say that that never happens. And I don't think that's true of any, uh, certainly any school that I've ever worked in, in in London. Sometimes children do get into altercations and arguments. But the general... Um, atmosphere around school and in school is one that, where that is uh, anathema to the way that students behave and it's just not really fundamentally a part of what happens um, on a regular basis in school. Um, excuse me, I'm just going to hold on. Um, we don't offer dance GCSE. Apologies, it's quite hard. These keep rolling down. Um, we don't offer dance GCSE, but we do do dance as part of um, PE. 
and it is something we have looked at introducing we work with another company outside of school called step into dance who run extracurricular sessions for us um, and it's not something we've ruled out offering but we haven't always had the numbers the pupil numbers to um, to justify running a whole course in dance GCSE but because we run it as a kind of um, a part of our PE curriculum and as an extracurricular um, we can signpost parents to where they can support children to do that and also where they could if they wanted to do a dance GCSE outside of school. Um, we do uh, ceramics as part of uh, design technology and as part of art. It's not a separate subject but it is um, something that is, is just sort of integral to the arts curriculum. Um, we have a policy where students can bring phones into school, but they're not allowed to use them. Um, and that's a kind of halfway house between the, the mobile phone policies of some other schools in the local area. Um, in that we know that parents tell us that they want their child to have a mobile phone on them so they can contact them after school um, and on the way home. But we don't allow students to use them in schools. And there are, there are very good reasons for that, apart from the enormous distraction that they create. For a lot of children, um, they have a tendency to, to have an addiction to their mobile phones. And we think it's really healthy for students to have uh, an, a period of eight hours in the day where they don't um, have to look at their phone. They're not allowed to look at their phone. So they're not um, obsessively checking social media. And actually we think that's a really important part of well-being, as well as all the obvious uh, issues that use of mobile phones can create in school in terms of distraction and poor behavior. Um, but we think it's a really important well-being aspect as well. And students adhere to it really well. You know, that it's just not an, an issue. I can't remember the last time that I had to confiscate a phone from a child. Um, it just it doesn't it doesn't really it, students just accept it and it's a normal part of the way that we operate as a school. Um, the credit and correction system. So um, credits and corrections are are terms for what lots of schools call merits, demerits. There's all sorts of different um, systems for it. Um, if a child picks up uh, a, a correction, for example, for disrupting a lesson, then that one correction on its uh, on its own doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean a sanction in and of itself. If they then go into another lesson and they pick up another correction for something else, um, then Again, that doesn't necessarily in itself mean anything, but that's the signal to the child that they've got two corrections and they need to self-regulate because the third correction means that they get a one hour detention. Now, the, the reason for that is that we didn't want to be able to go automatically to a detention for students. It's a bit almost like giving them a, a reminder and a warning, if you like, and some schools use a reminder warning detention system. Um, we use a, a correction system. So the students are, are able to self-regulate themselves and know when they need to sort of pull in their behavior. And they can pick up corrections for reasonably minor things, because as I said, a correction in and of itself is not a sanction, but it's almost like it's a, a signal to the child that actually at this point, you need to just stop and reflect on your behavior. Credits are given for um, either aspiration, character or creativity. Um, and students pick up correct credits all the time for um, politeness, for um, helping out, for helping others, for good homework, for good classwork, for good effort, for challenging something that is difficult, um, taking on showing resilience. There's a whole range of different reasons why teachers would award credits. We have about a five to one uh, credit to corrections ratio. So for every cor correction that's given, five credits are issued. Um, and that's really important for us because we always want the balance to be on positive reinforcement. Credits accumulate um, and those credits can be used for, um, they can be used almost like as a tariff at student services to buy stationery. They can buy a lunch pass to eat at the Sixth Form Cafe, which is the Grumpy Mule Cafe, which students always like having the privilege of doing. They can be, use their credits to get a um, early lunch pass so that they can go to the front of the queue. Um, and ultimately those, those credits accumulate and lead to them being in normal times going on trips at the end of the year. We wouldn't, we weren't able to do that last year because of, of COVID and the lockdown. But normally there are reward trips throughout the year. And every half term, there is a celebration assembly where students are given certificates and they are given badges and they're given a whole range of different rewards through our kind of reward system um, when they hit certain thresholds of credits. So children are really motivated by, um, by credits and, and, and corrections. They, it's really understood and it's really consistent through the school. Um, 
Um, there are residentials, so there are a number of different residential trips. Um, last year, we haven't been able to do it this year, but last year we did a residential the weekend coming, the first weekend of half term for all year sevens um, to Kent. And that was kind of like a bonding, uh, team building trip. It was really successful. Uh, but we have residentials that run all the way through the school. So children who study geography can go on residentials um, to Norfolk uh, for from Monday to Friday where they do kind of um, kind of uh, practical geography skills. Um, we last year we ran a trip to Berlin for our GCSE history students. Uh, Spanish students go to um, Spain for a week. So we have a number of different things and there is additional cost for those overseas trips. Um, but we, we try to support parents by having firstly an opportunities fund. So if families can't afford the full um, amount, then we can offer a proportional discount through this fund that we have running in school for, for children who've come from less advantaged families. Um, but also we spread the cost out so that you can pay it over a long period of time in instalments. Um, we do a number of different trips though that are free, that are paid for by the school, but those are usually not overnight trips. So those are sort of days out, which might be a day out into the Science Museum or to the Tate Gallery or to the theatre. Um, and almost always those trips are paid for and funded by the school if they are, um, if they're just uh, one day, um, for example, uh, experiences during the school day. Um, Uh, the next question was, do you do streaming? So we don't stream children, we set children. So the difference is, is that um, a child's uh, prior attainment in English, for example, means that they may go into a set two for English, but they may have higher achievement in maths in their, in their key stage two uh, uh, data and in their baseline tests. Um, and if that's the case, they may go into set one for maths. Sets are fluid. So if children perform well, they have opportunities um, three times a year to move up. We review the sets at all times to make sure that um, students are in the right places at the right time. And that's quite motivational for students. Um, and so it, it, it is a system that we think is really important uh, from the point of view of making sure that teachers, um, students learning is tailored towards what they need at that particular time. Um, as mentioned in my talk, we do do we do have an in-school um, counselling service. It's not difficult to learn your way around the school. Children do that really easily. We do a kind of treasure hunt when they come as part of their transition, um, and it, it's just not not an issue. They find their way very easily. It's um it's all well signposted, and it's you know it's a bit daunting in in the first few days, but then it's almost like they've always been here. Um, we offer uh, we offer Spanish as our main subject. It's it's the highest performing subject in the school in terms of outcomes, um, both at GCSE and A level. And we have made the decision to concentrate and focus on one language because, and we do it really really well. Students get phenomenally good outcomes. Our progress score in Spanish has been over two for the last few years. That means that students get on average two grades higher than they would in. Um, uh, in an average school and it's in in the top sort of one percent of schools in the country for Spanish outcomes um, and I think that's partly because we have really concentrated our attention on that one language very able students in languages are able to pick up French um, in year nine if they wish to but what we've noticed is that often those students haven't chosen to pat to follow it into the pathway so there is French offered as an option at GCSE but it's um, a subject that hasn't always run consistently because it's not there isn't always the demand among students they feel really confident in Spanish and usually they want to take that through and get a very um, good grade quite a few of the questions are about after school clubs um, our enrichment program is actually built into our school day so students have it as a period as part of their timetable what that means is that every child in the school does an enrichment activity every week of their choosing um, and that's a little bit different from other schools because what we noticed was that the most advantaged children were the children who were taking um, a you know the clubs offer and the children who we felt were the least advantaged and who we wanted to stay in school and engage and who we felt really would benefit from that cultural capital building that you get from clubs and enrichment um, those students were often the ones that were opting to leave so we have um, a whole range of different interventions that students can elect into and they can change they can stay in their um, enrichment all year or they can change after each term so they can do three across the year 
and they run from everything from classics uh, to chess club to martial arts um, to table tennis um, for uh, there's, there's, there's a huge number like um, arts clubs there are music clubs um, and then on top of that as well as the integrated enrichment that we offer uh, there's always a, two school productions every year, one at Christmas and one in the summer, and they involve a huge number of children across the school, whether it's from, you know, creating the set or doing the lighting or performing on stage. It's a really inclusive but very, very high quality offer um, that we, you know, something that's really important to the identity of Haggerston is our school productions. Um, we also run choir outside of the normal um, times and some of the sort of ensemble groups in music and the school um, uh, strings band, for example, as well as sports. So children who are trying out for sports or attending different um, sports enrichments, that usually happens after school. Um, and it's by children select into that or they try out for it. And, and other things like school fixtures for um, sporting teams happen outside of school as well. So it's a bit of a mixed model. Children, all, every single child, will have some enrichment of their choosing and they will potentially change three times across the year if they want to but um, there's also other things outside of that that children can get involved in our enrichment has been the thing that's been hit the worst by covid because it, we can't mix year groups so some of those mixed um, interventions that we would have done um, enrichments that we've done we're much more limited on at the moment but as soon as we are able to get that back up and running we will um, uh, we, we'll be doing that um, I noticed someone's asked about a breakfast club. We have a free breakfast club. So children are able to come in and they don't have to pay for that. And we offer that every morning. Uh, we think that's really important for students. Um, and yeah, we hope to be able to continue that. Um, so someone said, can you give an example of one of the things you've taken from an outstanding school that you've implemented at Haggerston? The DPR is something that we've taken from Forest Gate Community School. They were a school um, which was uh, requires improvement about seven or eight years ago, and they are now in the top five um, schools in the country for pupil progress. They've gone on a sort of phenomenal journey of school improvement, um, and they uh, we, we've worked quite closely with them on a number of different strategies. But one of the things we took that we thought was most powerful, and which they told us was the most powerful, one of the most powerful levers in their journey, was the DPR and this ability to define the curriculum in quite um, structured ways and give parents the tools to understand specifically where their child needed help. Um, as well as the motivation for children of really understanding, well, okay, if I need to improve in science, where are the areas I need to improve? And they're able to see that three times a year by the, um, the way in which teachers judge them against their key objectives as being either secure or developing or consolidating. So that's something that we've, we've taken and we, we've been able to develop a relationship that's been ongoing with Forest Gate. You know, we're, we're a community school, we're a local authority school, we we're able to collaborate with all the schools in Hackney, but we also have have really firm relationships with other schools outside of the borough and across the country actually where we've been able to um, build relationships so that we're always outward looking always looking for ways in which we can um, bring a sort of competitive edge to the school um, students can bring pack lunches there is always a vegetarian offer um, and a um, meat offer um, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to 100% say that the vegetarian offer is always vegan because I think sometimes there is cheese in it if I um uh, yeah sometimes there is cheese in it but there is a vegetarian option and there is a, a meat option however this year we are consulting on um our uh, um arrangement for our catering so we're going to be going back out to consultation um, on our catering arrangements and so one of the things because there is increasing demand from parents to have vegan options on the menu um, and other other you know uh, sort of expectations of the school in terms of its school dinners um, we're going out to look at to see whether there is um, a different kind of offer that we will be making and that would be in place for September next year um, so at the moment, I think it's school dinners are good. Students like them. Um, we, you know, a very high uptake in the school of, of school dinners, but we still feel that that's an area that can probably um, get a bit better. Um, someone asked about voluntary 
network and community engagement. And um, we run the, the Duke of Edinburgh for all children in year nine. So every child in year nine is involved in the Duke of Edinburgh and has an opportunity to complete that qualification. And um, a core strand in the Duke of Edinburgh um, award is a volunteer, volunteering. Um, and that, that's something that every child in year nine will take part in. But on top of that, we also have a charity club, we have an environment society. So there are different groups within the school who of their own student groups, which are led by a member of staff, where we will often have events running through the school, charitable events um, or, or awareness events highlighting certain issues in the school. Um, and that's something yeah, that's a really important part of our kind of character education process. Um, you can learn an instrument. So we have um, lots and lots of children in all year groups who learn an individual instrument and that's really important if they want to go on to do music GCSE where um, ideally they would be a grade four standard and we can subsidize some of those lessons for families where there are um, difficulties in paying for them. Um, somebody's asked if you can see pictures of the inside of the school. There is um, quite a comprehensive set of videos on our website on the transition page where you can see a tour of the school. So you can see what the school looks like inside. I'm currently sitting in our library, as you can probably tell, um, but you'll be able to sort of see a kind of camera view of how the school looks inside and what the facilities are. But there are also some, some bespoke videos. So there are videos about our special needs provision. And um, there are videos about our different subject provisions. So you can look with as much detail as you want um, on each of those videos to find out as much as you can. What we've tried to do is give you a as comprehensive a view of what the school is really like um, without you know, having videos that are so long that people are just not going to have the time to watch it. But please do visit, if you haven't already, the transition page and watch those videos because they, they will do a better job than I can of showing you what the school is like in action, what lessons are like in action, um, because they were, they were made during the school day. Um, I'm just going to make sure and see if there's any I've missed. Uh, how do you tackle bullying if it occurs? We have a, a really um, uh, key sort of strand in school is about education awareness around bullying. So we do a lot of work with children um, where we, we you know, are very clear that we have a zero tolerance policy on, on, on bullying, but also on uh, bystanders. So a lot of work with students on not ignoring it when it happens. Um, I would never say that it never happens because I think that any head teacher that says there is no bullying in the school um, probably hasn't looked closely enough because things do happen between students. It's almost, it's part of, I think, um, adolescent development that sometimes things will, there'll be conflicts and disagreements. And we are very astute about when those disagreements turn into something that is a little bit more sustained or sinister. And we work with children um, closely. We have sort of peer mentors in year eight who support in the playground for children in younger year groups and help them with any peer to peer issues they have. So we're engaging the students in that education, but we also have a designated team of staff Staff whose job it is to root out bullying and to um, support students who are struggling with their peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, it's a part of our PSHE curriculum, of how, what healthy relationships looks like. So that's important, not just for when children when they're at school, but recognising that bullying is not just something specific to school. It can happen in the workplace. It can happen in all different walks of life. Um, so we have quite a comprehensive approach to it. And I can honestly say that, um, you know, it, I think we do very well with that as a school. I think that there is um, minimal bullying in the school, but when it happens, we're really robust in how we deal with it. One of the hardest things to deal with is what happens outside of school. So what takes place on social media um, and what takes place when we are not um, altogether and able to sort of witness it ourselves and we work with parents around that as well around monitoring um, children's mobile phone usage and we give severe sanctions for children that conduct that online um, and sh students know that their online behaviours can impact on sanctions that they may get in school if they're not responsible or if they're cruel or if they in some cases um, you know do things deliberately to hurt others. Um, there's the student council in school um, and it's part of a much bigger comprehensive student voice program so we have a number of different student leadership programs in school uh, we have future leaders in the sixth form we have head teachers ambassadors in year 11 we have seniors in year 10 and we have the year eight buddy system in year eight so every stage of their journey through the school students have opportunities to become leaders and ambassadors for the values and qualities that we promote as a school 
but they're also as I mentioned before there is an environment group which is kind of an action a student action group on environmental issues we have a pride youth network which is a group of students who campaign for awareness around LGBTQ issues um, and we have a, another burgeoning group of students um, in the school who are working on projects around Black Lives Matter so it's a combination of structures that we have set up to foster student voice and then encouraging students to take the initiative and be, be part of their own um, groups that they develop and support them as staff to develop their own action and awareness um, campaigns across the school. And that's something we encourage and it's something we're really supportive of um, and it's really it, it really helps with when students come into the school and they are making their transition from primary school it's not just a teacher-led approach we involve a lot of students in helping our year sevens to settle into the school and understand and feel um, what the school systems are and feel safe because we're able to use our student ambassadors to help with that and a great example of that would be we have six form mentors for some of the younger students. So students in year seven may have six form mentor that can help them to settle in and, and be supported in that transition to the school. Um, how long is the school day? So the school day runs from um, 8.30. We expect students to be on site. It officially starts at 8.40 and it finishes at 3.30 every day. And Monday to Thursday, there is a, a six period day which finishes at 3.30. And then on a Friday, we have an early finish at 2.35. Um, we made an adjustment uh, two years ago to our school day so that we would be able to sort of front load um, the activities into Monday to Thursday and then we recognise that actually um, by being able to increase the length of the school day and include more lessons Monday to Thursday that one of the knock-on benefits was that students finish a little bit earlier on a Friday and that's often when they were at the most tired and the least productive um, and actually that means that they can go and recover and rest over the weekend and also complete homework and things like that that they need to do over the weekend so they're ready to come back on the Monday. Um, some students in year 11 may stay later to do extra classes um, as I said some children might be staying for year 7 football or they might be playing in a fixture um, and that's again there is a sort of busy life outside of school that sits outside those normal hours but our, um, off, off the, the main um, stretch of the school day is kind of 8.30 to 3.30 Monday to Thursday and 8.30 to 2.35 on Friday. Um, yes, heads of year do continue through the school with pupils, although that doesn't always happen because sometimes um, heads of year are promoted, sometimes heads of year leave and we have to make adjustments. But the principle is that the um, heads of year will stay with their year groups and where that can't happen, then we put, make adjustments and, and, and move the team around a little bit. Um, I think that that is probably all of the questions that I've had. Um, so far um, as I said if oh, somebody's asked about um, staff turnover so we have very stable staff so we have staff who we have a number of staff who've been here for many many years um, and we have um, we have a, a sort of core group of very stable staff in the school but we also have some churn every year and actually that's um that's not always a bad thing that can actually be a really positive thing because then you have uh, fresh voices fresh faces coming into the school who bring new ideas um, we have generally had a policy where we don't have any supply teachers in the school um, because any cover lessons were covered by SLT in what's called our study centre. That's been more difficult this year because we, are, we can't run the study centre because we can't mix multiple year groups. So since September, we have had um, a few supply teachers that have come in to cover staff absence. But longer term, once COVID-19 um, issues go away we would return to a system where we we really have a kind of closed door on supply teachers and that's not because we have anything about against supply teachers it's just that we want our staff who've had our training who understand our systems and who are able to to teach and, and support students in the way that we want that to happen at Haggerston we recognize that having um uh, you know staff coming in who were temporary created an instability for students that um, both in terms of behavior and learning that we didn't want and it was a sacrifice that as senior leaders we were prepared to make to say that we will cover those groups um, to make sure that the learning and the quality of, of education stays high at all times um, and that's something that we as soon as we're able to do we return back to um, 
there is a, quite a few questions about SEN. We have a fantastic um, special education needs team with a really diverse range of skills. Um, and we're used to supporting children with high need and we're used to supporting children who, um, with uh, specific learning difficulties who require sort of minimal input, but monitoring and um, you know, regular engagement with families, uh, exam access arrangements, for example. Um, so we have a, a wide spectrum. Um, I feel that if you if you watch the video on our website about our SEM provision, which is predominantly being led by our Senko Martina, who's fantastic, um, she'd be able to give you more specifics um, um, on all the different interventions that we run, because it's not going to be relevant for everyone who's listening. But also she and her team would be very, very happy to call you to talk about your own individual child's needs and how they would be supported at Haggerston. But it's something we've worked very hard at over the last three years and something I'm extremely proud of is the way we're able to be inclusive and the outcomes and successes we have with children who have complex needs in school. So I can, you know, I'll sort of finish that point on just assuring you that your child would be in very safe hands and we have a lot of experience around the, um, dealing with a whole range of different um, educational needs. Um, okay, uh, someone said, do you know that your students are happy? Um, I would never want to just say, yes, children at Haggerston are happy because that's quite broad and it fails to recognise that no human being is happy all the time. Uh, children are not always happy. Um, adolescents go through ups and downs. And one of the works that we've done with the Anna Freud Centre, who we've been partnered with over a two year period um, uh, around our wellbeing and mental health provision in school, we, we've been very fortunate to be part of a pilot and have a lot of government funding to um, work on that. One of the things we've understood is that it's about um, educating children that happiness is something that they can help to construct by making good choices around their health and well-being and good choices around their friendships and relationships, but also to help them to understand that not being happy on occasions is a normal part of human experience and knowing what to do when they feel anxious, and what to do when they feel stressed about their exams or when they feel upset because they've fallen out with a friend. So, yes, I think students in Hagston broadly are very happy and proud to be Hagston students. And, um, you know, I talk to students every day who students, you know, children don't hold back. They tell you what they don't like and they tell you what they do like. And they don't they're very open with this about things that they you know, want to see improved in the school, whether it's, you know, they want more chips on the menu or they want something else um, to happen in the school. But they're also um, but they're also they will also talk to us really openly. And we've created and fostered that open open um, uh, relationship in the school where children feel that they can come and talk to us when things are not going well. So we, we want to develop in our students a kind of um, a, a resilience to difficulties. You know, all students and all human beings at the moment are, are, are in a, a period of pandemic where we're all having to deal with negative messages all the time and negative realities and a lot of fear. Um, and actually, as a school, that sometimes means that just like we do as adults, sometimes children feel anxious. And what we've wanted to do as a school is build all the support structures in school to support children when they are struggling and to build in them the resilience and self-confidence that to know how to manage what's normal, what isn't normal, when to seek help um, and, and how to communicate with others around them when, when things are difficult. Um, so happiness is, is, is something that obviously we're always wanting to build in everybody, but we want to do that in a deeper way, not just in a kind of superficial way. Um, one final question. Do you have a system to cope with medical health needs? Yes, we absolutely do. Um, we have a number of children who have medical issues in the school and we have a very comprehensive system to support those students. Um, it, it, it's probably true of most schools because it's a legal requirement of schools that we have that, but we've got a lot of experience in dealing with quite a diverse range of medical needs and we do that very successfully. So it's not something that um, you would need to have any concerns about. Um, I'm going to finish there because I'm conscious of your time. Um, I hope that I've managed to um, answer those questions as fully as possible. Um, obviously, it's not the same as being able to have an individual face-to-face -face, uh, conversation with you, but it's not the end of the process. So if you want to um, let us know 
anything else that you feel hasn't been answered, please do refer to transition at Hagerston dot hackney dot seuk um, h dot uk you can also join our facebook and twitter pages and you'll see lots of kind of day-to-day -day information that will help you get a flavor for the kind of projects and um, things that go on at hackerston and, and the kind of school that we are um, but also um you the website we we've deliberately put onto the website as much detail as we can to help you to make a decision that's right for your child um, that to, to understand what it is that we offer here at, at Haggerston. Um, really, really grateful for your time this morning and um, good luck with the decision. Please contact us if you if you have any further questions and um, I look forward to seeing you in person at some point and hopefully meeting a lot of your um, lovely children come September next year. Thank you.